Welcome everyone to another episode of Dynamics Corner, the podcast where we dive deep into all things Microsoft Dynamics. Whether you're a seasoned expert or just starting your journey into the world of Dynamics 365, this is your place to gain insights, learn new tricks, and hear from industry experts. Telemetry is the pul- pulse. Telemetry is the pulse that monitors the heart of performance, providing clarity and insight needed to push the boundaries of what's possible. I'm your co-host, Chris. And this is Brad. This episode was recorded on February 6th, 2024. Chris, Chris, Chris. Yes. I want to know, did you know uh, something about me? Did you know that my two favorite foods are pizza and sushi? You can't go wrong with either, man. It's also one of my favorite dishes. And did you know that with pizza... I like to drink it with wine. Yeah, but did you know, which we're going to learn in this episode, that you could drink it with something else or they, people from different places drink it with something else, not wine, which is surprising. We learned so much in this episode. <laughs> you did. This episode, we covered uh, some, uh, some dining tips, some locale tips for a specific country. We learned a lot about development and performance, and we also learned a lot about performance with telemetry. This was a big knowledge packed episode. With us, we had the opportunity to speak with two great industry veterans that are known for their uh, work with Business Central, performance, telemetry, and many other things. We were able to speak with Stefano D'Emiliano and Duilio Tocani. Someone's at the door. Oh man, iPhone's always knocking at the door. I need to grab I another chair though for this corner. Why do you need to grab another chair? I wonder who's behind yeah. this door. I think we had someone coming in. There's two people coming in. I, I lost track of the schedule. Hold on a second. Let's see who it is. Exactly. <laughs> good morning. Good. good afternoon. Good morning. Good morning. How are yeah, you both morning. doing? Uh, yep, everything yep. okay? Oh, everything okay, US? Everything is okay here this morning. How is everything oh. over in Italy? Yeah, it, uh, all good. Oh, sounds good. Uh, lots of uh, working uh, problems today, but <laughs> <laughs> this, this, despite that, everything is okay. Yeah, good, that's good. good. Uh, Stefano, how is your leg doing? Uh, uh, today, I'm. Uh, a lot of problems in uh, a custom integration with Shopify. Is a central oh. Shopify. I, I never yeah. work with with the Shopify app. I was talking this morning with Duilio. Uh, yeah. I started exploring that app uh, just uh, yesterday because we have a yeah. project with a customer, uh, and it's, it's quite a pain because it has different logic that uh, conflicts with yeah. uh, custom approvals of orders. Uh, and so today I had. Uh, but he, he's why, always why? talking about work, right? He asked, how is your leg? Your leg. Yes. Ah, my leg. Sorry, 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 sorry. I was thinking. It's okay. I, I like this work story. Not the jet oh, leg in leg, your my mind. Leg, my leg is like this. <laughs> uh, you still got the cast on and everything. Yes, uh, my, my leg uh, is, uh, at, the, at the moment, is, uh, is like this. Uh, I need yeah, to yeah, wait, yeah. wait until the end of this month. Plans are 23 of February to remove the cast. So, finger crossed. <laughs> no, no, yeah. def- definitely fingers are crossed. I hope that everything goes well and that you recover well. Uh, I would thank you both for taking the, the time to speak with us today. Uh, you know, as with each episode, I'm always excited to uh, speak with everybody who comes and sits in the chair to talk with us. Uh, you both are very well known and you both do quite a bit within the business central community. So uh, it's both a pleasure and honor to uh, sit and be able to speak with you. So I appreciate that uh, uh, greatly. Uh, Thanks to you uh, for hosting that. Uh, 
yeah, been following both of you for a long time and <laughs> seeing your yes, uh, yes, you know, yes. posted uh, late at night because it's a uh, timing, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. that, and then, I, there's I one thing that I have time. always loved to do that is Chris, Chris, Chris. Oh, uh, I did it! I did it! Chris, yeah. Chris, Chris is now. <laughs> yeah, love it. It's a staple yeah, to this it. podcast. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Well, if if you would, you, you can say it again, Dwilio. Maybe uh, what you could do is uh, take a moment and tell everyone a little bit about yourself. Okay. Yes, so I can say Chris, Chris, Chris again, and then yes, so. Uh, my name is Giulio Tacconi and then I'm born and live in Italy. So I was born in Pesaro, that it is uh, close to the Adriatic Sea. So probably I was running my bike and then uh, diving into the Adriatic Sea when I was young and then moved to Milan in, nine, well, it was 1999 or 2000, something like that. Long, long time ago. And uh, I, I started with... Uh, working with uh, an ERP in 1998, actually, in Pesaro. And then I moved to Milan. It was um, a, a legacy ERP system and with a proprietary language that no longer exists anymore because nobody uses it. It has been bought by uh, an Italian brand and then it has been moved to uh, C Sharp and then I think also ESP.NET uh, within this one. And uh, I think I did it all, all the circle of uh, a customer partner and then Microsoft because I started working for a customer that before used to work with this legacy program. And then they moved it with uh, Microsoft Business Solution Navision and it was version NEV 3.78. And we were using a user portal. Well, it, that was really another age. We used to work with uh, SQL Server 2000, that is version 8. And initially, the SQL Server had 4 gigabyte RAM, and we served uh, something like 80 people. Yeah, that was a, a big thing. Then we moved from 80 to serving more than 100 users. And then in the evolution, uh, uh, I found out uh, a places in Microsoft, and that was 2008. So from a customer, then I moved to customer in 2008 in the technical area, and then I was in the customer support and services from 2008 uh, until last June. So 15 years, actually, in the, in the support in Microsoft, uh, in the ivory tower, so to speak. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then after that, I closed the circle because I'm, I'm going back to the... Uh, you know, to the field, and the, now I'm with the infantry. You know, with the with the army of uh, EOS. That it is uh, uh, a, an Italian ISV, and uh, it, it is known to be the one with the highest number of abstract apps in uh, a, for Dynamics 365 Business Central. Currently, we have more than 120 apps. Too much, too much apps you have. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah. that is a lot of apps. They, they and create I like the apps for. They create apps yeah. for every, every single field. Oh wow! <laughs> well, we have we have a lot of componentization, and in the beginning, the design we started very very early, and in the beginning, the design with the table extension that we know caused quite a lot of join was not so clear. That was causing so much trouble in, in problems. So before version 23, and there were quite uh, performance problems related to uh, multiple table extensions because of this, you know, small componentization that you can add one on top of the other one. But after 23, it is just a big, big relief. And this tends to be right now a super winning solution because compared to other ones that developed monolith because of this one, or they just added maybe a base with all the, the, the table extension that is preventing to have this kind of componentization right now, it is sort of winning solution, but. Well, that's yep. something that I would like to continue to talk about. You're talking about the redesign mm -hmm. of table extensions in yeah. 23, where 
they no longer they have one extension table instead of having multiple extension tables causing right. the sequel join for each. I like the analogy that you had with uh, the ivory tower in the infantry, and <laughs> it is good uh, I, to see that you know you have the experience of working both from the customer point of view, right. the partner point of view, as well as from the Microsoft point of view. So you have a, a deep understanding. Uh, of how the application works and what it takes to have a successful implementation, which is great. Uh, exactly. Uh, uh, Stefano, how about yourself? My, I started my career in IT a long time ago. I start, I studied computer engineering in Turin, and then uh, uh, after just after the graduation, I start working uh, in Turin as a developer, pure developer. Uh, in the Microsoft uh, ecosystem. So my first uh, job in the IT industry was uh, developing a, a software for the healthcare platform. For an healthcare platform, we creating a, a low level software for uh, uh, proprioception analysis. So uh, tools for uh, uh, making uh, analysis of proprioceptions. We have customer like uh, Juventus Football Club, Inter Football Club, the uh, Ski Federation of Italy was our customers. Uh, after that project, I moved. Uh, I was moved to a totally different uh, division in my in that company, and uh, we had uh, we started with uh, one of our biggest customer was uh, uh, in that time. So I, I'm talking about uh, year 200. Uh, uh, 2000. So, uh, 2000. Uh, uh, one of our biggest customers was called the Control Cena Service. Control Cena Service is uh, uh, was the the entity that uh, uh, managed the, all the cinema in Italy, and uh, we started the project, uh, redesigned that app, and that app was moved to uh, a new software that uh, a new Microsoft technology that in that year was born. That is was called .NET. Uh, we started that project with .NET 1.0 uh, in a totally distributed way, so uh, from uh, a totally uh, on-premises and uh, home-made uh, application, we re redesigned that software to a distributed solution based on uh, web services uh, and something like that. We was, I think, the first in Italy that we started the project uh, uh, with that technology. Uh, we work uh, uh, a lot with the, the Microsoft team uh, uh, for in this project. Uh, after this project, uh, that for me takes about uh, two years. Uh, I moved to a totally different. Uh, I decided to jump from uh, Turin uh, to uh, my home. My home is in uh, the north of Italy, in, in near uh, near quite near Milan. And uh, I changed the company, and uh, I started uh, a new adventure in a, a company that is a Microsoft partner working mainly in, uh, in that year, in uh, an ERP called Navision. Uh, so I started with Navision 2. Point, uh, I don't remember, I think 2.6, my first version <laughs> of Navision. Um, you beat me, you beat me. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I started from that release, uh, mainly from in for integration part, but after a few months, I started uh, working directly also in CIL, something like that. And uh, now I started embracing all the, all the release. Then the vision was acquired by Microsoft, uh, and I follow all the path. So that's what how my adventure with with uh, Navision and then Business Center was started, and that was also the reason why I was in contact. Uh, I start knowing uh, Duilio because uh, when I move uh, uh, from my old company to the new company, uh, we, we have done in the, in that previous job uh, we have done a lot of work in SQL, optimizing SQL and something like that. And uh, I was contacted by, uh, I remember, do you maybe remember better I, than me? I, I, a, I a, hired a friend, him. A, your French uh, <laughs> boss. Belgian, Belgian. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I we don't remember the name or Belgian. Yeah. I don't remember its name. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, he asked me to, if I can uh, help Je them on, uh, yeah, exactly. If uh, I can help them on optimizing uh, a, a totally unknown software for me in that period that was 
uh, Navision that they were using in that company. <laughs> and uh, we started uh, knowing that next. I worked with Duilio in, uh, for some days uh, yeah. on SQL level and uh, on uh, optimizing uh, uh, the tool that you have. I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, it's, it was a tool. Uh, I don't remember its name. Then, yeah, um, the, di the di digital dashboard. Then it was yes. for, for collecting timesheet. Exactly. And then with yeah with three point seven eight you can use the digital dashboard and IIS five I think that was full of security leaks <laughs> but anyway exactly yeah yeah um, yeah that, that was really a... tough times exactly well but that was uh, why along. I met Julio yeah no and, it's good and it seems you have yeah. a great relationship now and it seems that uh, everyone has a. Uh, I was listening to you talk, both of you talk about the history, and it just reminds me a lot of the changes that have happened over the past several years, uh, you know, with uh, the application back from the days of Navision all the way through the names of you know, business solutions, Attain, uh, Dynamics Now, yeah, they had all these up to where it is now with, uh, you know, Microsoft Dynamics 365 Business Central. Uh, yeah. and changes was you, when extremely a lot, I think. Yes. Oh, now, now there are a lot of changes. I, I think uh, it, it's still a little bit new. I think it will level and settle. I know now there's some changes and there's some adapting being done to uh, the rapid changes, as some people refer to it. But I think it will level out once once the waters get settled. I mean, I think when Business Central was first released, uh, it was just sort of to get it out there and, and uh, get direction. And now I think with a lot of the involvement of everybody it will level out but uh, you both talked about a number of things and stefano i read a lot of your articles your, your blog is one that i have on my to-do list to check each day to see if there's any new content so i do have some uh, conversation uh, i'd like to have about some of the things that you spoke about but before we start you know you, you're both in italy uh, i have yep. yet to, to go to italy uh, i would love like to go one one year or one day uh, I did have the opportunity to go at one point. My son was studying abroad in Italy, uh, huh? and uh, he went, I think it was in January 2000. And then in, uh, I had planned to go during the spring when he was on break because we were going to you know, go from Italy all the way down to Spain and back up just to check everything out. And unfortunately, he got you know kicked out of the country at the end of February because COVID came, and he didn't have the opportunity to go back. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. He, he was there for it's a little a over a month. And uh, he enjoyed it and he liked it and uh, he, he was able to experience some of the culture. But, you know, here in the United States, we, we think of a lot of things when we think of different countries. And I have to ask, you know, when people talk about Italy, they think of pizza and pasta. Uh -huh. <laughs> we, we have prepared something for you. No. We have a surprise. Yeah, yeah. You have can, a can surprise. We, yeah, absolutely. Can can we share a, a PowerPoint deck or something like you that? You can or? share. Yeah. Yes, ahead. you may share a PowerPoint at the bottom yeah. of the screen. There's a share window. And yeah, like... oh, we have a surprise. I like surprises. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. No, as soon as we, uh, as we, we, as need, we need to better explain. Uh, uh some uh, italian uh, habits so uh that's why we have uh, just prepared something this, this sounds good everybody great. needs to listen and watch this is what i, I want... need to listen to is i need to understand the italian habits i, I did hear it's a beautiful country and yeah. i would uh, you know you know i i have hopes and i think i just need to force myself to get over and travel through europe uh, because i enjoy you know speaking and meeting you know people of different cultures and backgrounds and understanding you know there's a lot of old countries there and there's a lot of old history and i like the old architecture of the buildings uh in the cities and um... yes i think that in italy there are a lot, lot of good places to see and also a lot of best places to eat and uh, drink <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so my I've... favorite things to do eat I've... and drink uh, yeah okay. i bet yeah okay. can i share this not Upload this live presentation, bookademo.now, or I can simply you share. Can share. At the bottom, there should be a, a, win, a button that says share, and it will, huh? and you can choose the window that you'd like to share. Yeah. So let me share the screen. Oh, yeah, right. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let me see. And, and the, the slideshow that you are sharing will put up on the YouTube channel as well. And for those that are yeah, listening, right. we'll pop okay. through yep. the slides. 
Yes, uh, yeah, that should be the one if I'm clicking sharing. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Okay. okay. <laughs> I love this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I, this is okay. great. This uh, a slide of demystifying Italian yeah. violence. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So perfect. And welcome to this. And then the first thing that is, does Italians communicate with justice? And Yes, we communicate with Jester. So <laughs> even Messi, that is from, came from Argentina, is communicating with Italian Jesters. We do this everywhere in the world, and and as you can see, there are also books about how to speak Italian. So let let me see if I can go back to the presentation in here. I don't know how I can move this back and forth. This right now i think if it's a powerpoint you might be able to either use the arrows or click like a presentation let me see if i can do this mm, yeah but i have to put so this Italians do communicate with jesters that's that's <laughs> yeah, fact communicate one. With gesture a lot uh, <laughs> in, in every conference we do i have a lot of photos like this <laughs> because i <laughs> normally when i speak i use <laughs> gestures every, everywhere <laughs> Yeah, and then so let's get get one like this. You know what it means? This one. What does that mean? What does so that mean? You're, you're putting your thumb. <laughs> yeah, across. I'm not yeah. doing it because I don't know what it means. You're putting your thumb across yeah, your keep, face or down. Your keep it. Keep an eye. Keep an eye. Be watching because this one got the scary here. Means this guy <laughs> is tricky. Oh. Oh. Right? So it's, I'm gonna watch because you're tricky. Right, so right, it's right. point to your eye yeah. and then thumb down my yeah. cheek means yeah. watch because you're tricky. Exactly, exactly. I have to try to remember that. Yeah, yeah, but now you have to find out how to move the the, the slice. The, the there. slice. Oh. <laughs> Can you uh, <laughs> keyboard with the arrow? Yeah, yeah. Then okay. The then let's do button. one the next yeah, one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, perfect. <laughs> then the second one. That I love. Italian versus coffee. So, <laughs> well. Most probably you go there and then you order normal coffee. But in Italy, we just have a wide variety of coffee. So we want it hot, we want it cold, we want it with latte, we want it corrected. Corrected means corrected with grappa, with other, other kind of alcoholic. We want it in the uh, glasses and it is plastic glasses or it is uh, uh, another kind of glasses. So. In fact, uh, even Messi said, what? <laughs> yeah. So when you order a coffee, yeah. depending on how you order it, also well, based on the way that you order it, also determines the cup or glass that it comes in? Yeah, indeed. So cappuccino is bigger. All the other ones are, are uh, small ones. We big and don't have... so big like yours. Yeah. Like, big. like the America. Well, American yeah, coffee is, is like this. Story. This is my morning coffee. I have two of these. I don't know what I would order there. So on the screen, what is your? Which of these do you prefer? You know, which one of these do you both prefer of the, of the list here? It seems to be that we have uh, twenty, about twenty five, twenty six different yeah. coffees listed here. Uh, personally speaking, for, for me, coffee is, is not a drink, but it's a moment of pleasure. So I start, <laughs> I, I start right. my, I start normally with a cappuccino. Cappuccino for, for, for in Italy is uh, uh, a medium cup with, uh, with coffee and uh, milk. But then, as Luigi said, no cappuccino from 11 a.m. So uh, in Italy, normally cappuccino is only to start the morning. Then we move uh, to uh, espresso, what is called espresso. Espresso is uh, for us is a right. small coffee, and uh, I, I like coffee because uh, uh, it gives me the illusion of being awake. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's why we, why we start uh, normally with uh, more than one coffee in uh, during the during the day. So cappuccino right. first, and then espresso in the second half of the day. Exactly. 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 And and okay. if someone is taking cappuccino after 11 a.m., then he's from another country, <laughs> not an Italian. <laughs> yes. And so, then, so we have we have to remember all of these in the event that would if we, we we go on tour and go to Italy that we can't have cappuccino after 11. 
Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And as, as yeah, I well, told, I have a glass of wine. As I sometimes told I'll to my colleagues, uh, <laughs> sometimes I usually told to my colleague that Microsoft calls BC. Uh, why BC stays for before coffee. So yeah. normally, <laughs> normally in the morning, we, when we start BC, after that, we need a coffee. <laughs> oh, this is ah, awesome. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. This and, is and, just an hour. Yeah, and another thing is about uh, the, the, the cappuccino or the coffee. This goes with the sweets. We never order salami or a toast with cappuccino or something like that. So yeah, that is ca cappuccino and coffee goes with the sweets. So you get yeah. cookies or whatever this kind uh, of thing. Okay, cookies like oh, dessert. That's another one of my favorites. See, I, I yeah. told you I like to yeah. drink and eat. So and have coffee. I, I drink coffee, water, and some sort of wine, yeah. whiskey, or vodka. But I like to have a nice pastry, as you call it, a sweet. That we call exactly. it, I think, a pastry, just just for resemblance. Uh, with my coffee, yeah, so this is already going to be like the country I need to go and just stay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then go to the next one. Then Italian versus wine. Well, right oh. now it is just it is just a little bit blurry, but yeah, the the thing is that we have you have fifty states in the U.S. and we have twenty regions, small ones, but every region is totally different with wine. And the same applies to pizza, the same applies to pasta, the same applies to everything we eat in the north, from the south, if you're from the coast. And we are just like a small state. And even within the county, it, it is different. So, exactly. Yeah. And, and, up, and another thing no ananas with pizza. Oh. <laughs> There's no what? No ananas no on the ananas pizza. With pizza please. No ananas. Pineapple. Pineapple ananas. <laughs> yeah. It, uh, no it. pizza. Pineapple. Yeah. You <laughs> no, stand. No. Oh, There's I, no I, Italian. I, <laughs> right. I say right. to everybody, pineapple should never be on pizza. It's. I know no, some no. people like to have pizza with barbecue sauce and bacon yeah. and such. And I myself, I enjoy making pizza. I make my crust. Yeah. Uh, it's a, a a big thing for me. But right. I would never put pineapple. So the wines of Italy. So these regions that we have, we have, I'll, I'll not do well with the pronunciations. I mean, some of them like Toscana, Sicilia, uh, uh, Abruzzo. See, I can try to have my Northeast Italian accent with the pronunciations. <laughs> so each of the 20 regions has a different type of wine or flavor of wine. Yeah, th definitely. So we just have, well, only the, the highest level, it is, I think we have 70, we, we, probably 80, close to 80. But then we have more than several hundreds of DOC. Uh, so it is like geographical, uh, uh, typical things. So everyone has got every, every, every single one. Just, just one small uh, inciso on the pizza. And then we go back to the wine. I have found out one of the uh, pizzeria in Italy the, that is serving pizza, one of the pizza was called uh, Signore Perdonali, that in Italian means uh, God forgive them, and it was pizza with pineapple. <laughs> 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 that is just uh, So, yes, you asked about wine, and uh, see, that's a continuous flow. Then I have divided the two regions. The region on the right it is Piedmont, and it is the region with uh, 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 where Stefano lives, actually, and Marche. Marche it is my region where, where I'm coming from. As you can see, there are quite a lot of uh, different ones. The, the one in, in Premonte is very famous for the Barolo, because I think it is one of the most famous wine in the world. I don't know if you ever heard about Barolo or Barbaresco. Those two are very quite, quite famous there. Wow. So... Yeah, I, I'm and, anxious to have wine now. I, I feel like I should go get a glass right. for this conversation. <laughs> yeah. So, so we're, yep. as we're going through, this, wine. I, no, I, no, I, I will go. I, I don't. I have wine here from local wineries. Uh, I, I'd like to support the local wineries, and I buy some bottles to have, and and sometimes I buy some uh, imported wine, uh, and I don't. Uh, 
it, we're talking about pizza. Do you have pizza with wine? Because that's what I have. Like pizza with me, when I make it, I put on, I really do, I put on the Italian dinner music, I call it on the, uh, the, the little uh, Amazon device. And I uh, pour myself some wine and I make my pizza. And then I have pizza with wine. It, it, do you do that in Italy? Mm, not, no, not too much. And, not too much. Beer. Yes. Pizza normally. Pizza, and beer. No, pizza yeah. normally is beer, but uh, uh, pizza and wine is emerging. I think uh, normally in Italy it's pizza and beer, but uh, I see quite often that sometimes someone uh, starts using wine with pizza. Yeah. I agree with I, I agree with you. you normally uh, beer, pizza and beer. No, normally okay. pizza and beer. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely. drink we drink wines with uh, we in all other uh, type of foods. Uh, life is too short to also drink mediocre wine, so uh, we, that's that's why that's why yeah. we have a lot of good wines in Italy, uh, different uh, uh, from countries to countries. So totally different, also in tasting and so. For example, I live in Piermont, as Willio said, uh, exactly like in that. Um, Top right corner of the slides here, where we are, where wines, our, uh, exactly, exactly, our famous wine are Bocca, mm -hmm. uh, Gattinara, and so on. Gemme, that are yeah. wines, red, red wine, strong wines, because here we have uh, 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 sand and granite uh, uh -huh. pebbles, so, uh, and uh, yeah. exactly, and that's why our wines are quite uh, strong. I don't like too much strong wines. I prefer uh white wines or something like that but here we live in a more, country where that's sweeter. uh exactly yeah. okay uh, this uh, I, I don't know what i do with all that wine i like white wine with fish uh yeah i, I like to have white wine with it's the, a the good fish. pairing I, I think perfect yeah, yeah, pairing yeah. with yeah. the pairing and that's i have so many questions now i wanted to talk about some business central <laughs> things but i think this is this fascinating is, <laughs> this is a this has my interest now because i talk about wine pairing, uh, pizza with wine. And I am curious to know which wine is your favorite of them all. Is it your local wine or wine from another region? Do you, do you drink wines from other regions? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, so, my, my, one of my favorite wines is from Trentino. Uh, mm, something like the Gewustra Miner. It's a white uh, wine that I personally love a lot. Uh, yeah, very aromatic one. It is very exactly. aromatic. So it's like, uh, let's say it's, it's not Sauvignon Blanc can be compared to, but it's got quite a lot of flavors. Lychee, you know, the, yeah, exactly. uh, the, the Chinese fruit, it is very, you can, you can smell it, the lychee. It's very good. You know too, it, much, it, too much about me because a lychee martini is one of my favorite drinks, but I don't like the lychee martinis that are made with just uh. syrup. I like the lychee martinis with that lychee fruit in it, and I usually have that with sushi. Yeah, uh, definitely. You know, then you have to try uh, Gewurztraminer. Uh, uh, you have to try Gewurztraminer with, uh, with sushi. That's perfect pairing. It's perfect, they are complete. Yeah, okay. it, it's a marriage. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, oh, I will have to write that down. I'm taking maybe notes. Ask, yeah, yeah, yeah. Send, send <laughs> yeah, the suggestions. We will send you please, recommendations. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I will, tr I will try it and let you know. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. you need to do that. The beauty of wine is that for for two hours, your problem when you drink wine for two hours, your problem then belongs to others. So that's why <laughs> <laughs> that's why we we usually use a lot of drinking wines. Yeah, oh, this yeah. is so fascinating. That's, I love this. That's what yeah. I hear. You write better code uh, at the more you drink. Yeah, that, <laughs> indeed. I, I think yes. that's uh, helpful. Okay, so we're yeah. understanding the Italian wine. So that myth and understanding uh, is now out there. Exactly. Uh, the yeah. There, you, there, so you, let, ha there move... you have it. No, no, no pineapple and pizza. And no, no, you, no, no, no. Right? <laughs> and then, and then beer and pizza. Exactly. Beer and pizza. Exactly. You put, perfect. Yes. Do you put anything on your pizza? I mean, I know here because regular cheese pizza. My son and I, we. We go to different pizza places uh, and we like to compare them, you know, because pizza is uh, quite popular over here uh, and it is different by region. And we get cheese pizza as a baseline because, you know, cheese pizza is the basic. You have cheese, sauce, crust, then you get a good baseline for it. 
but then a lot of these other pizza places, you know, pep, they put the pepperoni, you know, some people uh, put mushroom, sausage, onion, uh, buffalo, uh, French chicken, fries. you know, it's, it's over here, uh, French fries, French fries yeah, on oh. pizza would be good. Yeah, so French fries and some, beef Is that, is that what's popular in Italy or is it, uh, pre, yep. uh, pre, uh, usually just the plain cheese or do you have, uh, you know, favorites that you have with topping? Yeah, so it is called Margherita because it was in honor of the queen in Naples. That was the Queen Margherita, and it's called Margherita, the, the the original one with tomatoes and cheese. That was the original one from Naples, and they do it very, very tall. You know, the 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 the, the pizza and, and not so so thin. That is very particular from Naples, and you can put whatever you like. It is on every flavors, but. Yes, and for the babies. mozzarella, sausages, it's quite yeah. common in Italy. I, yeah. For example, I love a lot with uh, pizza with uh, hams, uh, right. mushrooms. Uh, mushrooms. Uh, uh, in Italy, there are very, very um, different type of uh, uh, pizza. Uh, also emerging like what is called gourmet pizza, so pizza with particular... Uh, a with particular truffle. type of uh, mm, mozzarella, a particular type of sausages, something like that, a uh, particular type of hams. So mm, pizza is uh, uh, started from a poor uh, food, but now in Italy, uh, <laughs> it, it's not only for poor. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's one food that is of my favorite, uh, sushi and pizza, yeah. my two top favorite foods. Uh, along yes. with wine, vodka. I, I agree. So if you, uh, I would fit right in, I think. Here, here oh, I am God. at five in the morning searching for wine from Boca. I found one. <laughs> so I, I, I may yeah. pick one up this coming weekend. Uh, uh, it's a, a Boca yeah. from Piedmont, Italy. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Gattinara, Gattinara yeah. is one of the most famous in Italy. Gattinara yes. uh, is another very famous uh, yeah. wine in Italy. Okay. It is coming from Nebbiolo. It is like the, the it is like the, yeah, uh, the Barolo. So it is like the Barolo. It, it is Nebbiolo. It is the same grape, but they do it this in this kind of region. So it is. Exactly. Oh, I, found, I would suggest getting <laughs> there. Yep. Good. Good. Yeah. Uh, Good. Geez. Then. Yeah, then let's go with, with the next one that it is Italians doing better. That is, <laughs> that is, I, I, I don't know, but that, that's, uh, you can see on the right that it is Madonna. It is not us that was saying something, but it is, I think, Luis Veronica Ciccone. So, Miss Ciccone said that the like Italians it. do it better. I don't know what we do it better, but we do it better. We can so, confirm. <laughs> Yeah, we can confirm, you know, we, we do better <laughs> pure cast, we do better performances, better, better, better apps, it, it, we, we do better. So, and no. the, the one on the left, you can see as Lady Gaga, but Miss Germanotta is, of course, got Italian origins and even Dean Martin. Dean you know, Martin. Is, yeah, Dean the, Martin, the, the, Al yeah, Pacino. From, yeah. Robert De Niro, Al Pacino, and the other two guys, Demiliani and yeah. Tacconi. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a, a great cast that you of uh, famous people that you put up on this slide with Madonna, uh, Lady yeah. Gaga, uh, Al Pacino, yeah. uh, Stefano, and Duilio. So you, you, you all fit together up there. It's yeah, perfect. definitely. All great developers, functional consultants, some PMs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Al Pacino's car face was a PM, so uh, don't, don't mess. <laughs> don't you mess need to use it. the slide when you do a presentation, Stefano. Like just start <laughs> your presentation with the, this slide and just say Italians do it better and have your face. Exactly. We can't start like this. <laughs> Maybe you should Next put Chris time... and I in the corner peeking in. Oh, <laughs> Next man. time we will do that. <laughs> Yeah, this is gold. I, right. see, I want to. I want to see pictures of it. Okay, so Italians do it better is the next uh, surprise treat that we have. And exactly. <laughs> I'm going to guess what the next one may be, but I'll, I'll wait just in case I'm wrong. No, the next. Uh, no. Oh, no. the next. No. Uh, now we go back into the business central stuff. Now we can go back to yeah, the business. Definitely, <laughs> definitely. definitely. Okay. In, in fact, uh, 
we, we have removed the names so that <laughs> <laughs> you don't know who's talking about. So, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Well, that's it. So now it's, we have a nameless and now we have a, a sheet uh, entitled Performance Patterns and Anti-Patterns. This is where I wanted to talk with you both because I do follow a, a lot of the content and conversations that you both participate in whether it be on your blogs, whether it be in conversation or some of the discussion groups. And to be honest, there's some I try to keep up with and some I, I can't because uh, you get into some deep performance uh, conversations about Business Central for uh, you know some of the changes that are coming in there. So I'm thankful that we have the opportunity to talk about this and I'll call it demystify Business Central performance. Okay, good. Okay, so let's get this started and then with small things. Let's talk about first about UI and application. So, well, that was just a, a little bit sparse. So we're a little bit scattered of, of the things that we, that were popping up my mind uh, and also in the Stefan one and then just resume when he resumed his server one. So we can do this just one by one so that we can put one seed and then, because you, you can talk quite a lot about performance, we can stay in here with all the wines that you would like, pizza and coffee, and then we can make it one, two or three days uh, podcast. So let's start with just one by one then with the UI, that it is maybe something, so from the top to the bottom. So from the top, the first one, it is, okay, very easy. When you go into the uh, pages itself, so one thing is that you go, you jump into the list, then, for example, when you do go into the list, then you start using the search. Well, the, the search itself, when you start typing, then it is trying to search what is typing on all the columns. That, let's say it is an alphanumeric character in all the columns that are exposed on the page. So it is good if you have small records, but the more records you have, and then the more time it takes searching. So you might find, let's say, one search takes one second, then you just have seven, eight columns, then this might take seven or eight, seven, eight seconds. And you, you cannot specify, I want to filter the, this column, the other column. So I want to search with this column on the other column. So it would be better if you use filters because filters means that on that specific field, it can be number or name, then on, only on that one you're doing your kind of searches. So that's the, the first suggestion. So with the, the new feature that they added where you can search across all tables, would that go into this category of uh, searching or is that a different pattern that they have? Yeah, that, that's a different pattern because... It's a different pattern. The, Yes, because that one it is searching uh, in the code in multiple tables and uh, it is somehow governed, but you have to, to take care of where you're searching for. So this is sort of navigate the, the new one, this, uh, the, 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 the data search. This one, it is the normal one. In every list, you just have this bottom top left you know, with the, uh, where you can search it. And this one spans for every column. So the more column you have, you can see, and then the more closing in the where, and then the more is uh, trying to do a search. And then this might take quite a lot of time. And yes, and this might be a killer if you have quite a lot of record in the list. So it's better if you if you use filters so that you can search in one columns and the good would be if that column is in a, in a key in there. So that is yeah, the thing. That's searching is probably an yeah. area where um, the team can improve something because uh, uh, searching, I agree, that is quite useful for the user going to the top left corner right. and searching for a list, but uh, in terms of performances is not implemented in the way it should go. 
Oh, it is much easier because it's one yeah. click type versus exactly. clicking on the filter, picking the field, right. typing in the value, or right yeah, clicking yeah, yeah. on the column and doing right. you know filter filter to current value. So yeah. it, it is an easier uh, feature to use, even though it may not perform the best. Right. Yes. Well, but and honestly, it would be great. I don't know. Well, if we can implement per per user, so if if you can. If you can select, okay, in this list, by default, all this kind of fields can be searched, but then if user can say, okay, I want to search this, 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 and that by default. So I can use only name and number, for example, then that is all, then I can search it. Just as small things. Yes, then that, in, this could yeah, improve. Yeah, definitely. As experience, because this one can be a killer and gets, and might get, uh, might generate frustration on the user, this this kind of stuff in here. Yep. Now let's go in the second one, uninstall and use the extension. Well, the, the, the typical one, it is the Shopify one. There was quite quite a lot of rumors about when, when Shopify popped up, it was adding uh, uh, a, a new field. Uh, well, I do not remember. Maybe it was adding a field on the sales center and then another one in the sales line, if I'm not wrong. but. Anyway, it was adding uh, this kind of new new fields in there, e even if this one was not used. And then th those new fields was doing kind of other joints, right? And then the and 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 this the other joints have kind of weight when you're doing this kind of uh, queries. Right now, with uh, uh, the new table extension paradigm, maybe doesn't make smaller differences, but well, if you don't use this kind of extension, then uninstall it, don't use it. Another one can be the universal print. The universal print is always, there's an event that is always checking, okay, is this universal print is using? So if you don't use it, then uninstall it. Just, so exactly. keep this just strictly yeah, necessary. Yeah, more the environment than like, like this possible. Like this is possible, yeah. it's better. Yeah, exactly. So uninstall any of the unused extensions and right. don't go in and start in installing a bunch of extensions that you're not certain what they're doing and leaving them in there as well. So uh, yeah. now okay. when you say uninstall, are you saying just keep it uninstalled or unpublish if there's other extensions? Does, if it's unpublished, does it have an impact on performance at all or just the oh. uninstallation? Yes, as long as it is uninstalled, it is fine. Right. Okay. You yeah. can unpublish and it's okay. Yeah, but so uninstall, it, uninstall, sorry, uninstall and it's okay. Yeah, uninstall it is fine. Well, with, with the unpublish, and then you can opt for the deletion of the data sign, then this one will um, actually remove what you have. Uh, it, well, not, not in South, I think this one it is preserved until there will be the Armageddon in 20, I think it was in 20. 25 wave one, Microsoft announced that all the the old schema from version, I think 14 onwards, I do not remember when was it, all the schema with obsolation, this one will be completely cleaned up. So this field will be completely removed and erased. Otherwise, this one will stay there forever. So, but yes, if you uninstall, it is fine. But if you uninstall and publish, it's better. If you don't use it, make it clean and as clean as possible. So it is it is far better. That is that is the thing. Okay, so yeah. performance tip number two, uninstall unused extensions yeah. on the UI and application tips. I like all this. Yeah. This is a good performance lesson. Um, yep. So the, the next one, it is this whole number of series. So number of series, it is something that was, well, in the history that it was one of the, the part that it, it was locking because there is a mechanism exactly. where where you take the next number in the number of sequences. And this one was keeping locked the number of sequences because it was taking the number of sequences and it has to be sequential. So as long as you complete your transaction, then you got, uh, you know, your ticket number, your number of sequence number, this one, it is, it is kept locked. So the next in line has to wait for the transaction to, to move on. So if you use this non-blocking number sequences, when it is possible, of course, this mechanism, it is done at sequence of 11, then will uh, will give you this 
kind of uh, number. The drawback of this it is that this one it it is it might give you this number, but then you cannot revert this back. So there might be gaps in in the numbers, but as long as this is not a financial uh, requirements to have this in the table, then why not move into this kind of number of sequences? So, yeah. so with non-blocking number sequences, you're talking about in the coding pattern, so using a different number sequence than the standard number series as it exists today, where it goes to get a next number, waits for the transaction, then it commits the transaction and the number. Now, uh, what you are mentioning to use a non-blocking number sequence would be to get the number, save the number in essence, so somebody else can get the next number, then that would be saved with your transaction. If the transaction fails, that number does not get used that you have, but at least you weren't locking the other users on the number sequence tables. Is there anything within Business Central today that uses this, or are they still all yeah. tied? The no, no, yes. Yep. In the number series, in the number series now there's a parameter called uh, allow gaps in numbers uh, that you can set, and uh, this is uh, honestly uh, during the setup of a business central environment. Honestly, is one of the first thing that I rec always recommend to do. Uh, so in, when you set up number series, uh, check if you really need uh, not allowing gaps. Because if uh, you allow you for for you it's okay allowing gaps, you have absolutely a, a performance boost in terms of uh, throughput and performances and locking, allowing gaps in the number sequence. So hmm. I don't know in US, but in Italy, for example, we need to have uh, no having gaps in uh, financials, in, uh, in some financial transaction only some financial transaction. Why, for example, in uh, exactly in orders you can have gaps. In uh, customers, vendors, and so on, you can have gaps. Uh, so, for example, sales order or sales shipments is one of the classical example. Uh, much better to allow gaps because uh, there's no regulatory requirements to have uh, to no gaps in a sales order or a sales shipment number. And this, when you post a sales shipment or post a sales order and something like that, improves a lot the performances because you avoid a lot of locking. So uh, normally it's a one of the most important, I think, recommendation to do when setting up business central for the first time, check number series and allow, uh, set the allow gaps uh, flag on every number series that uh, you want to allow uh, to be non sequential. To allow gaps, not yeah. sequential is always a sequential, but uh, you can, where you can admit gaps. Oh, that is, I could see how that could help with the performance uh, on the sales processing side because you have sales orders with a large number of lines, you're using warehousing or a number of other features within the sales order no, processing. No. You say it shipments, for longer. example, improves a lot. Uh, when you have a lot, a lot of say, shipments or a lot of warehouse shipments, something like that, uh, posting a warehouse shipment or posting a say, shipment locks and tables just, just to have the number series. And if you allow gaps, uh, uh, a set of lockings are not executed, and uh, this improves a lot. Right. And the, the mechanism is quite simple. It, it gives you a number. So it is like a ticketing system. Give you a number, give you a number, give you a number. And then they give you. doesn't matter if you roll back or if it's good. That is why you might have this kind of, but it will give you. And the other procedure will say, okay, wait, this one, and then this one has to commit. And then the next one, the next one. So there's... If, we, uh, if you want to allow for the gaps, then you have to use this one because it is super, super fast and completely handled by, by SQL Server. So, exactly. Yep. Let's go. So now we're into some warnings here. Yeah, exactly. So that's the the so uh, one thing about the 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 number of series in telemetry. You will spot this quite easily if there are those one are typically the one that are keeping the lock higher than 750 milliseconds or more, more than one second, depending on. I can see this in telemetry, and then I can say I can get back to the developer saying, "Can we change this uh, procedure?" And then you just doing the uh, allow gap in numbers, because most probably if you 
re-implement the system. Let's say that those are coming from NAV, then they move to Business Central, and it is a re-implementation. Then also uh, use this kind of uh, number of serum with allow, allow gaps, and do not use the other ones because we used to use that one in the past. And I can, you can spot this out in telemetry quite easily because you can see from the call stack that, that it is the the it is related to the number of series. And then you can say, okay, just do this in another way so that we are reducing the number uh, of locks uh, within the application itself. So, so this is just, you know, invite everyone to use telemetry because this one will, will make your life and troubleshooting easy. That's what I wanted to comment on. It's I have a lot of comments to, to both of you. Uh, I'd like to take advantage of the opportunity to get to, to speak with uh, members of the community who have uh, you know knowledge on a number of areas. I, I did want to touch into uh, the telemetry, and thank you for mentioning that. I mean, telemetry, you know, some discounted or may not see the benefit of it, but as you uh, uh, imagined that. Uh, or mentioned, you know, you can use telemetry to help find the performance issues easily just by looking for, you know, long running queries or, um, you know, other uh, events that trigger or other, yes, other events that are traces that you have within telemetry. Yeah, yeah, uh, well, absolutely. Well, in, in the online version, you're completely blind. So you navigate by the star if you go with the online, because the, the back end is completely in a fortress. You don't know anything. And then Microsoft keep it very, very safe so that the only signals that you have from the back end, it is what telemetry sends you. Otherwise, you, you don't have this kind of uh, visibility over there. And then there's another surprise. We have something about telemetry after all the, all the performance lights that we have it, because yes, actually, Telemetry is something that we have to use to, and the more we adopt uh, and we get used to, and the better it is because the on-premises world it is moving completely to the to the online, and it, as you can see, let's take for the AI for example, and actually everything that it is AI related in in the what's new that you can see from twenty twenty four wave one even that it is uh, AI related, it comes for the, the online version. Within your premises, you just have to do your own uh, connector, so to speak, right? So everything it is moving on on the online version, right? So, and, and within the online version, you don't have any more SQL Server profiler or any kind of control on, on the SQL Server metrics, uh, so to speak, that you used to have on the premises. And that is why you have to to take the, the telemetry. What does telemetry? Uh, oh, what is the output, outsend, and built in? Like you know, in the Lego, you have to build in your own, you know, house or castle, and every kind of signals can be combined to the other. And Microsoft is adding signals release after release, and that is, that is good. So that is my advice: it is use telemetry as much as possible. Give it to democratize them, give them to the to the developers at least. Functional, it is just a little bit still early, or you can do something different. You can do dashboard or graphs to functional related to the uh, observability, mm. to the data uses, how it is moving. To the developers, you can do all, all the bunch of stuff. Interesting. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, we have something on the telemetry more on, on the slide. So. Excellent. I, I'm a big telemetry fan now. Uh, at first, I was a little afraid of it because there was a lot to it. But once you understand the traces that you can filter and the dimensions, it becomes quite helpful. Uh, and we had, uh, you know, discussions before on some of the uh, traces that you can filter out or, or uh, avoid so you don't have so much data to go through. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So there are seniors that well, the RT003, for example, is one or T004. The one with the authentication, well, the one with the authentication mostly were uh, thought to deflect cases for the online version if you cannot connect. Why you cannot connect or something like that. But for example, if you have APIs, and then let's say that you have 
100,000, and we have it, 100,000 seniors for the APIs. We have 100,000 seniors with RT008, that it is the API, and then you just have the equivalent, RT004, that it is the, the, the creation, uh, the, the successful authentication for the API. So you don't want this one, actually, so you can filter this out and then re reduce uh, the cost of telemetry. But we'll go back to this even later on, right? Okay. Okay, so now we have some warnings I see yeah, that you have on the UI to, to watch out for that affect performance. I, lo I love the yeah, first one. Yeah, so <laughs> the first one, the last one. <laughs> and the last one. <laughs> and everything in between. <laughs> exactly. So th there's always, when you do this kind of massive things, then there's beware. When you do bad things, you have to, to be aware, for example, when you do rename or you do the copy company, that's a very user activity that implies quite a lot of work into SQL Server side. And then this one will most probably drag down the, the performance. So do this during non working hours and keep them monitored. There are seniors in telemetry that will tell you when you, the, the life cycle seniors, when you did a rename, when you do a copy, who did it? <laughs> 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 of course, <Need> names. This, <laughs> yes, exactly. Not to point the fingers, just to have a sacrifice. Group. No, no, no. Oh, no, no. <laughs> no I, a, I can't tell. I can't tell yeah. you how many times I, I've had uh, calls for you know support issues with performance, and you come to find out somebody makes a copy of the company in the middle of the day because they wanted to test something or try something <laughs> in a copy of the company. Exactly. <laughs> and it really does. It locks everybody up in, in that company while it's doing the copy. So if you need to copy uh, the, the company. Create a sandbox. Hopefully you have a good need. Make sure you do it when it, it's not going to have uh, on others at some off hours. The yeah, next the, one is another big one that you have on this list. Yeah, the, the, the rough start. So you just have to do import. All, all this kind of big things that do quite a lot of insert or modify or they touch tables in a massive things then. You know, you just have to use a semaphore. <laughs> just have to use a semaphore. Let the people work on this table and then if you can do this overnight, right? Otherwise you will be you know, just like a big giant or just a big giant that is typing, 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 try to send quite a lot of stuff in there. I call it, you know, the, the silent killer. There are quite a lot of silent killer. API is another silent killer. So we have this big environment we just where you have, and this is online environment, where there are 150 concurrent user means concurrent because line says that there might be maybe 200, something like that. This 150 user, it is fine. But if you, we just told you have to be B2B communication and this API, it is something like uh, 115 or 200 per minute on average. So you have like other one session that are, so those are other guests, other people. The same things with the rapid start, but the rapid start is different than this one. They say, okay, I'm connecting, I'm doing this 300 milliseconds and get out. So this one, it is different. The, this one, it is just, you know, the, the, the grasshopper attack. This one it is, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, if you want to put this some more on a biblical way, and then this rapid start, it is a big giant that is hammering. <laughs> that is sending you, I just want this kind of big user all together, let me do this, right? And yes, rapid, about rapid start, uh, uh, we need also to say that rapid start was absolutely improved uh, in the last uh, two years because uh, uh, now it sends uh, uh, nodes with many rows to a background session. Uh, so nodes are treated in parallel. Uh, uh, I think that uh, from, I don't remember, it was uh, in 2021, uh, Business Center released version that they have changed the rapid start uh, engine. So it's much more improved compared to the past. But uh, uh, I agree that rapid start should be a warning because uh, abusing of rapid start, especially during working hours. Uh, but it wasn't designed for that, uh, Stephen. Rapid start means that this one it is for one shot. 
you want to yeah. start with Business Central, take all the stuff, put inside and start it, and then forget about Rapid Start because you started. But people exactly. use this one to import export things, to right? Import export things, yes, exactly. <laughs> even during the day, even uh, yes, it, it was yes, yeah, abuse. And it's now the, we are it's the normal tool to used by this. yeah by uh, by it's a lot of users. It's that I would. I wish you could shut off because of what you had stated. It's a great tool for some small functions or at the or, beginning, as you had mentioned, the rapid start of the application, yeah. but it also goes to, uh, to note that sometimes the users or, or even those implementing it may not be aware of the features or the implications of using it. And I wish cases like this for the rapid start that you could, you know, uninstall it in a sense or shut it off. I know you can govern it with permissions, but this would, you know, be a nice way to just say, okay, we'll set up the system and be done with it. And then if they need to do other imports at some point uh, for, you know, if they have do acquisitions for a company or something, they want to bring in data and they don't want to put it in a separate company, maybe turn it back on uh, to, to allow for it. But, or, you know, some yeah. way to note that, you know, be careful that you use this. Absolutely. Yeah. And then the, the famous change log. Change log has oh. always been there. That's the uh, yeah, <laughs> mass destruction yeah. weapon. They have to call it not change log. Well, the, the change log it is. Sometimes I found some developers use it to track, keep track of the things that is what's going on, and then if they, they keep it turned on, then they forget about that. And then suddenly we had you know, 15 gigabyte of data <laughs> in the change log. That was more or less. 20% of the database, and then we just have to, you know, delete all of this data in the bunch. So you mean, you know, I've seen implementations where they've had problems with the change log. You know, they like to just go put on, you know, insert all fields, modify all fields, delete all fields exactly. on something like a sales order, or, you know, or some of these documents where you have a large number of changes with every stroke. And some don't realize that it has to do rights reads and writes for every single entry for, and you have an entry for each field. It's not like it's just copying a record and putting in there. It's each field in that table that you have, if you put all fields is being logged. So the number of records and the size that you have for it to go through and do the insert is uh, uh, crazy. But, and I hear some arguments to why they need to keep the change, but I still sometimes shake my head and don't understand. Oh, yeah, about security log uh, recommendation is, ob is obviously, as you said, uh, don't uh, select every table or, or entire field in the table, but carefully select the field that you want to log. Uh, and also, uh, I experienced that uh, uh, when you set a, a change log entry, you can also specify uh, a security filter in that change log entry, and that security filter has impact on performance uh, so uh, because security filters are handled uh, at the SQL level and uh, sometimes affect performance so it's much better uh, not you I honestly don't use security filter much better to define the permissions at a more granular level or uh, and also uh, another thing related to change log uh, now, Bing Business Center has uh, uh, the uh, um, retention policy to clean the change log. So, uh, after a lot of companies tracks tables, 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 logs, 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 and uh, uh, this the change log grows a lot. And uh, uh, I don't think that is needed to having a, a change log, uh, a massive change log. So, uh, Business Center now has a possibility to automatically clean. The, the change log with retention policies, and this should be a best practice to adopt in that case because it reduces the the uh, the, the change log. Yeah, for for anything, I use it for just to track the initial uh, setup tables and just leave it alone, and then set your retention policy. Um, but other than that, I don't do it ever on a high volume tables changes. Mm. Yeah, well, it, it depends by customer to customer, but this is yeah. something in the implementation that we are forcing to do, because sooner or later, then this will start to grow. So 
the, the exactly. ERP is growing, growing, growing. And then when you work with baby tables, it is fine. It's like the Kronos. <laughs> Kronos, it works. Yeah, try to, to put inside some half a million or one million records, and then you'll see that you can't, you can't work. And then this is just, you know, an, an insurance. If you activate the retention policy, just the insurance that you have baby people done automatically for you on, on the ones that can be done, of course, right? The, the change log, the, all, all that ends with the log has to be in, in retention policy. Job queue entry log, anything. The dog log, everything, everything. Yeah. And, and here's a exactly. sign that many have on their door or on their yard. Beware of the dog. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <is> the dog? <laughs> now, then, this means be, beware. Every time you do something, consider the impact on performance. Well, there are, the developers are super good, but they have also to think about the performance. Means they had, okay, one record, two record. Performance is made mainly if you want to condense the things on two, two things. When it is concurrency, you have to think about, I'm not the only one doing this. There will be hundreds of people inside this, right? The second thing is that the records that is inside here is not one. That might be one million records. So if you work with this kind of mindset with concurrency and big tables or growing tables, then most probably you develop with that another kind of mindset. And then you refine all your statement, you use satellite fields, you, you try to use power partial records and you and you, you try to streamline your code the best in order to have best performance yeah you know, for a lifetime for a lifetime yeah you know. right let's move to the next yeah then uh, let's go to the development A again we just have pasted here the things that we have in mind so it is just, you know, some pills that you can take up and then for everyone, there can be arguments. <laughs> Let's take this one about flow fields and queues or all centers. And I would take the, the queues or all centers. So I have always had a, a controversial love and date for the queues. So they are good for, because you can see them, it is good to see, but they might be deadly for performances. So for all because of those are rescheduled to be executed in times every n minutes. So sometimes really they they might give a, a, a very hard pressure on, on the on the back end itself. And if you have quite a lot of queues that are doing this kind of stuff then then this is no good for performances. In in some cases we do do not use queues. We just simply work, start with uh, Rule Explorer, and then from the Rule Explorer, we navigate on, on other stuff. So we don't use the, the fully fledged Rule Center with all of this dashboard and fancy stuff. We go directly for, for the meat, so to speak. <laughs> that is one of the issues that I had encountered a lot in the early days of NAV. Even I think I remember some instances of NAV 2017 with the fact boxes. Everybody liked to create fact boxes. And I remember one instance where I, I can't, it takes five minutes for my customer card to open. And how we solved the performance issue was turning off a fact box that they had created that basically summarized everything in every way to give them a customer summary or a customer snapshot uh, on each customer card. And just that alone with the, you know, the calculation of the flow fields uh, in the queue brought their system uh, performance to something that was not optimal to say the least yeah well one thing we we don't have added is that with the fact boxes you can use page background task so you can use a page background task so this one will create the background task so that you can see the ui but you do not see data and then you can do whatever you like and then only when the, uh, the, the background task is finished then you can see the results of pro in the uh, in the fact boxes yeah, but in any case, the, the background task that you created is issuing something on, on the backend server. So even fact boxes, if you do some calculation, that those have to be done wisely. And then you have to analyze how much of this kind of query you do server side. And the other thing is it is on the flow fields. Flow, with, flow fields, it is, I don't know, 
But sometimes I think it is just again a blood maybe you know I, I it is a blast from the past the flow fields flow fields were born when there was still the native databases with native databases implemented this flow fields and the calculation was finger snap right but then the port of the flow fields with uh, dynamics and EV it was with sieve tables before it was entire different tables that was maintained by the application and then and then starting from NEV 5.0 SP1 from what I remember correct me if I'm wrong Stefan we had yeah. this uh, uh, indexed views it's so-called received mm -hmm. yes. and yeah and they are good sometimes but sometimes it's better if you don't this these flow fields can be replaced by something else I don't know maybe a query or don't use it at all because those, those flow fields I don't know maybe you, you leave it and then sometimes in some pages or somewhere those are calculated and then blown up your performance even when those were not needed not displayed and so on and so forth so that is the message or do not abuse or be careful on flow fields yeah it's like it's also better when you when you're using code uh, as said before uh, Avoid using cal fields. So a much better pattern is using the set out of cal fields because cal flow fields are virtual fields. Uh, and if you in a loop, you, you uh, with, with the set out of cal fields, you can calculate them before looping the records. Uh, and in the in during looping, the fields are automatically calculated, and that this improves a lot the performance of code. So, so a best practice when you have a loop. And from in this loop, you should you need to re re retrieve uh, calculated values. It's absolutely better to write a code with set out of autocal fields and the list of fields that you want to calculate, and then looping. Uh, much better in terms of uh, uh, performances. And the same is as I said before. The, the part the, another uh, quite for me an anti pattern is having. Uh, heavy code in your after get record or on after get current record triggers. Uh, in these records, you should never add the codes that, for example, do writes in the database because uh, uh, it's prone to locking uh, on after get record and on after get uh, records also uh, can affect uh, uh, performances of the page, but also performances if you uh, expose the page, for example, for web services, something like that, something that you should not do because now there are APIs. But uh, in, in any case, uh, if you do that, uh, uh, impact performances. So less is better in, in, this, uh, uh, in this trigger. Does that also include writes? I mean, reads, excuse me. Uh, writes, you had mentioned uh, explicitly to right. not use. But what about reads, uh, doing any reads of data in on after get record? I've seen some implementations where there's code in the on after get record that either gets a value or does another read yes, yes. of another table to put a value. Does that fall into that group of minimized work done? Yes, you, usually you should have only reads operation, not writes operation. Uh, less is better in these triggers. So uh if you don't have codes in this trigger uh it's absolutely better in terms of performances o obviously i agree that uh you cannot totally remove uh, uh, also in the base application there are lots of entities that has code in on after get record or on after get cool record uh the important is that uh, the important message i think that should be that less is better and uh, no rights operation on that triggers Right. Uh, right, but you know you have to let if you do this on the list, then you do, you do this on after get record anywhere. You can put a message. If you do this, you have to exactly. be sure that that you read just small things. Otherwise, it will be really a killer. On after yes. get record, typically it is just where you position last, right? So on after get record, it is just less than the other ones. But there are some procedures, for example. If you do the opening Excel right now, it will trigger the on after get your record all the time. And then it is like the on after get record. So it is a bit tricky. Then whatever you do in short, so you just have to be sure that the performance of your loop or the things that you do 
are just quite limited and not quite big because you risk uh, to have this on get record, get good record to be uh, re repeated many times. Many times. Uh, yeah, yeah. That, that is the thing. So writes are deadly because not only those are locking, but you write inside something that might be one times, two times, n times. Maybe you want it, maybe you don't want it. I don't know, actually. So avoid to do this kind of rights because those are completely uh, keeping you stuck on, uh, on on heavy locking situation. Read, you just have to read just small, small things. Exactly. That, that is the thing, so. Those are some great tips with the flow fields, the on after get record and the auto calc fields. Right. What else do we yeah. have? I get excited. I'm always waiting for the next. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that that's another one. So it was well. So for the if you want, we can stay quite a lot. NAV 2013 was the first one to implement uh, query. I think it was uh, Avanesians was the name of the um, of the girl that was PM for the query, and everyone was really excited about this new query object. But from that time, there was no much love because people would say, okay, let's create this, let's create a query editor in NV 2013. I remember it was in Rome, the EMEA directions. It was in 2013 or in 2014. Yes, I think it something was a, like that. Yeah, it, it was in Rome and everyone was asking why we do, we do not create an editor, like a visual editor to create query and then this query transform it into an object that we can run it directly. In, into into a pages, like instead of a pages, so bounded to a pages instead of a table, instead of doing this kind of loop where you open then you do all the stuff. But then suddenly this one goes just a little bit down, but th this L query obviously it is quite good because at that time there was this select star everywhere. Well, there was even cursor actually <laughs> still, but it was this select star then you were, you were taking everything, all the fields, etc. And the query object is quite super powerful because you're taking exactly what you want. It has just one single drawback that it is it, this query, it is bypassing the NST cache, the service cache. Because the, 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 uh, the, the service cache, the, the Dynamics 365 Business Center service has its own cache. So if you read something, and then this one can stay in the cache. And the Depending if there be modified or no modify, or you want to read something, then it could read directly again on SQL Server or take it from the cache. And taking from the NST cache, it is super fast. Exactly. But yeah, it, it it depends what you want. So even this one, you, we can open just a big chapter on chapter on if a query are the good things and then the bad things. But honestly, if you create the LQR and then measure it, doing the same things with multiple loops, because with, with query, you can join the result set. You can right? join tables. You, you uh... can join tables. And then that, that's your result set. And then you can measure if it is better using the query or or if you want to go with. Uh... And, and exactly. I see you have a note that with the query, there are, uh, isn't NST cache. Uh, on the use of a query. Exactly. Query objects are not cached uh, at the server level. So that's the only one drawback, I think. Uh, you have only, when you execute the query object, you are always the read from the database, uh, not from the cache. Uh, but query objects are, uh, despite that, I think that are very powerful in the many or many scenarios because you can uh, join multiple tables. You can also uh, having uh, uh, covering index that uh, gives you fast read, read performances. Uh, so it's uh, a good pattern in, uh, to use uh, when you when it's possible query objects. Yeah, you can redirect yes, them to the read only replica if you exactly. have one read only replica, of course. <laughs> Yeah. And I'm well, happy that we can now run, run those directly uh, recently. Exactly. Now you uh, can also run with that directly. directly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, you, in essence, you could use them, but you had to loop to load a temporary table in essence. But, exactly. Uh, or something else. But now with now us, you can uh, do that. the option to run them directly, I could see a lot of improvements if some people rework some of yeah. the 
I don't want to say dashboards, but a lot of the screens where they have a record and go off and calculate other values and, exactly. and bring it up and out the query with the joins will save a number of uh, performance issues. Exactly. Yeah, we, we do this quite a lot. We, we try to use quite a lot this query object. We're needed, of course, but because of there's pro and cons, but the pros are super good. Yeah. Yeah. And then there are the bugs, bugs operation. It's another yeah. impor important uh, performance uh, tips and pattern. If uh, possible, bulk operations are something that you should uh, use. Unfortunately, I think that bulk operations in Business Central are. Uh, Underestimated, uh, I think. Affect, affect, uh, underestimated and uh, also impacted by many hidden code behaviors because uh, uh, I see a lot of developers writing codes correctly, saying something like, uh, I don't know, uh, says line modify all or something like that, uh, thinking that that code uh, is executed in bulk. But unfortunately, yep. it's not always true because uh, uh, when you have a modify all operation, uh, normally a modify all operation or or delete all, I don't know something like that, uh, performs a, a, a SQL bike operations at the database level. But this is affected by having subscription, for example. So if you have code uh, that subscribe to table or insert or modify or something like that, this is affected. And uh, that that, that bulk box, operation is one that, like you had mentioned, is is tricky because I have seen a number of conversations uh, and posts about the bulk operations, and as you had mentioned, certain pieces of code will take out the bulk operation or, or prevent the use of the bulk operation. I think exactly. we have a whole discussion on certain code patterns that allow for the bulk uh, operations and those that will prevent the bulk operations. I myself, uh, in reading some of the conversations, I think you were both involved and I'm trying to remember, uh, there was a thread that we were talking about bulk operations and performance. And I was keeping up with it. And some of the, the information that I learned, and this is where it's important to, you know, to get into some of the groups such as Yammer and some of the other discussion uh, groups so you can see conversations yeah. about this. But I was shocked to find out some of the coding practices that prevent the bulk operations, you're like, wow, now I have to. Yes, have, bulk, know, bulk operations, exactly. Are powerful, but sometimes, at least in the IL language, pre prevented by uh, some hidden patterns, I think. Like, for example, uh, have a subscription impacts bulk operations. Uh, if you have blob feeds, impact uh, in the table, impacts bulk operations. And uh, sometimes this is something that. Uh, uh, developer don't know. Uh, if you have auto increment, sometimes in a language you can uh, specify that the feed is uh, auto increment true, for example, the primary key. And uh, the auto increment uh, impacts by cooperation. Uh, so there are uh, a set of uh, hidden, I think, behavior that impacts by cooperations, and sometimes uh, this can affect. Uh, Performances. So, bike operation is something that you should use in a lot of scenarios in IEL language in order to turn up performances. But just remember mm -hmm. that uh, some, some, yes. uh, something impacts on that. Yeah, so if, the thing is. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, with the blobs you had mentioned, Stefano uh, or Duilio. The yes. not to use blobs because it's always fetched from the DB and not cached. Does that also exactly. hold true for media sets? Uh, does no. do media sets no, have any no, impact no. or are no, they different? No, no. no me, me, media, media set can be used and those can, can be the right replacement for the blobs for possible. And you, exactly. you can even use bulk if you have media, media set. Right. Okay. Exactly. So yeah, media, in, media in set are case, much better. So in the cases yeah. where we used to use blobs before the media sets, uh, it is suggested to investigate if the media set could be an alternative for the use of the blob for your given scenario. And if so, it will result in better perform. It may result in better performance. I know there's no one, you know, with many patterns of what someone's writing for code and what they need to do, 
um, you know, these tips and tricks may not apply to everything or every scenario, but these are generalizations. So same thing with, we're talking about the media sets where uh, in the cases where you use blobs, if the media set uh, fits as a replacement, it, it may yeah. be better for performance uh, in, in a lot of cases. Yes, media, 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 media sets are much better because uh, they are always cached first, uh, while blobs are never cached. So in, with media, you have the advantages of using the uh, the service tier cache. Uh, also, also, yes, the NST cache. Uh, when when you save a media, also it has, uh, uh, for example, an image or something like that. It saves a thumbnail of the image, and uh, this is much light, and you can use that. Uh, blobs are never cached, and. Uh, uh, I always, when I talk about that, I always recommend, uh, if possible, despite media, media are absolutely better than blobs. But uh, today, especially on SAS, uh, we have the possibility to store um, media files uh, also outside of the database. And uh, in many, many scenarios, it's absolutely better to do that. Because you and don't less say, costly. Less, less costly. costly. You, you save yeah. space, uh, you don't save unstructured data into a table that is always a, an anti-pattern in terms of record efficiency or something like that. So if possible, it's much better and very easy to store, for example, a blob inside the uh, in Azure Blob Storage, and then maybe only saving the link to the, uh, to the business center record. And that uh, you save space, storage space, and uh, you you don't disoptimize your table, so it's uh, it's much better. That is a big tip to give because of you know that does come up. It's it's you have performance issues, you have as you mentioned cost issues, and also in some of the cases, if you have that shared media, you could have accessibility issues prevented too. Because if you throw it over in the blob storage, uh, that becomes available uh, outside of Business Central as well. Uh, if you want to have a shared exactly. repository, I know some use it for the marketing. Uh, documents or other things. Exactly. exactly. Yes. Well, one thing about the buffered insert. Exactly. So, the the, the thread was was started with uh, Waldo replied. One perfect thing is that one thing that inhibit the the bulk insert. It is if you have an auto increment field. Auto increment field is good. It is like the auto gaps number. It is super good because it is super lightweight, less locking than anything else. So. I would prefer to go for this no locking scenario, but sometimes bike insert offer something that it is good in terms of reducing the latency. And with the online version, the latency counts, so to speak. But the, the problem, the, when I blog at this one was the five, but nobody maybe catch at this one. The maximum it is five, but why five in, in this in this era, just five, let's say that I want to insert 100,000, but why only five? So just five, and then five, then five, then five. That was very, very old, and it was in the first implementation of the bike insert. Why not saying 10 or 15 or 20 or 30? Then you multiply this one, the, the, the bike insert that you have on the other side, and then you're reducing the latency. Exactly. So, and latency, it is important because your latency might be even one second, zero, eight, one second between the, your NSTs and the Azure SQL that you have on the side. So let's say that you want to push there 500,000, then you have to do, let's say that in the good case of the area table that was an example, nobody knows this area table. It is a code and text. <laughs> it is a plain example of something very easy. But then you have to do, if you have, let's say, 50,000 um, insert, this one goes with uh, 10,000 executes. And with 10,000 executes, and if this execute takes one second, those are 10,000 seconds more, right? Because of this kind of latency. And the problem is that the environment in the online version, it is something that it is ever moving. Because my environment now, it is bounded to one technology, one, one uh, uh, hardware. But then when we do an update, and at least once per month you move it to another hardware, then this Azure SQL, it is 
now bounded to another environment that, that it is another part anywhere, right? So you don't know if it would be better, the latency, but it would be different, of course. It would be better or less or more or less the same. So as long as you minimize this kind of changes here, then you're on the right side. But of course, there is a trade-off between the auto increment right, field that right. is good for locking and the bulk insert. But if, if we do more bulk, more, then the latency, it is, you, you see less the latency, so to speak. You, okay. Your perception of the latency, it is quite less in the, in the, in the online uh, world. Yep. Yep. The next. Okay. The, the next one, of course, use partial records uh, as much as you can. So, and uh, the, the, the partial records, it is a very good feature that has been inter implemented recently in Business Central, something that were not present uh, previously in NAV, and partial record, it, it was really uh, a game changer for performances because partial records allow you to have uh, send to SQL only the things that you really need of to build in uh, your your pages or whatever it is on the other side, even the record set. And and this means that you can keep the the, the, the query just uh, as much skin as possible. And uh, that that is a good thing that has been implemented. So if, if you are I don't know in BC fourteen with the web client or fifteen or sixteen or 17, I don't remember when this one was implemented. I think it was 19 or 20. I don't remember exactly when, but that's that's super good things. The partial records, maybe 20. See, it, becomes but... a, it becomes a blur as, uh, and, uh, to me as well, because the way the features come out, we're getting such improvements with the patterns and the language and the functionality. It becomes a blur to when they come out because now it's like, uh, and as I age, things seem closer than they really are you know i say oh that was last week and chris will tell me no brad we did that last year uh so it's the same thing i have a, a difficult time remembering with the partial records um and it's not so uh, important today because they changed the uh, structure of the table extensions but one question that uh, i've heard is with the partial records and having many table extensions can you eliminate the number of joins necessary by selecting fewer fields? Meaning if I have the sales line table and then I have several sales line table extensions, but I only need like the document type, the document number and the item number, you know, some of the base table, if I set those partial records to only those three fields, does that eliminate the join yeah. for those other table extensions? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it does. Okay. It does. Yeah. Partial yeah. records is also useful also today. Also if you offer if today, we have uh, uh, only one companion table and not yeah. different companion tables. Using partial records is, however, a, a recommended uh, best practice because it eliminates the join and it retrieves only not a select star, but uh, uh, only the fields that you really want. So it's yeah. much better to, to, to use that. Uh, and, yes, and, the of, amount of, and the amount of data, correct, as well. So yeah. it's better to retrieve three fields instead of 100 fields, exactly. excluding the join. Yeah. Then we have less data to send back and forth. So that, do exactly. we get a performance gain from that as well? Yeah, exactly. yeah definitely. Yeah. 150 and counting, if you refer to this line. Yeah. 150 <laughs> and counting, I, I do not remember how many. Plus and the one that you... records today is also a default applied to list. Uh, so uh the platform uses partial record natively in many cases and uh, related to list i i put that on the slide attention to that these two triggers because these two triggers are uh, uh in my opinion evil in pages so, uh, because this two, if you have code in these two triggers uh breaks partial records uh unfortunately uh in the base application there are some pages that uses that. I, I, I remember, for example, the item list. Uh, item. If you check the item list, uh, you have a code on this record. And what happens mm -hmm. here is that if you have an item list with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Th uh, thousand, thousand. Uh, of <laughs> records or, or thousand and thousand and thousand of records, 
uh, it becomes low. Uh, and that's the, the reason is these two triggers, because if you, you can experiment, if you have a slow item list, just copy the page, remove the code in on file the record and on next record, and the item list pops immediately. Uh, these are two uh, triggers that I honestly never used in, I think, 20 years of NAV or Business Central, because on file records overrides the page behavior on uh, when you find the record, uh, the specify the criteria when you find the record, while not the on next uh, uh, determines the next record that you want to display in the page. I honestly never have the, the needs to handle these triggers. I believe uh, it was used for the attributes or something on this flavor to keep the attributes. I don't know, but consistent. Uh, but yes, the things to know is that sometimes I for in the item list is a, is a classical example. The item list has a code on these uh, two triggers, and if you have a very large item list, this affects performances. So uh, we have cases where we change that simply. Uh, cloning, re cloning re re the page. Simply removing uh, that uh, triggers from the standard page. And this was also signaled to the product team. Uh, probably a day we will see something different, but at the moment. That is a great tip because yeah. I've received questions of I have 3 million items. Yes, some people have millions of items depending upon the scale and the size of the company. And they had questions, you know, can Business Central support, you know, three million items in my item list uh so it's it's good to to note that you may have or if there are performance issues with listing the items that to do the no, it, it supports you could own the page it, yeah, supports it supports it, absolutely. performance may be um impacted and if it is impacted with a large number of those you could do as you had mentioned copy the page and go over yeah um, yeah, yeah. Yes. We, we do the same exactly the same things so we, we did the same, we found out uh, the same problem, then we cloned completely the the, the item list, and then we, we created fast item list, and then this is the set, okay, this is the one that you have to use it. The problem is that you have to change all the pointers. So now you, everything has to point to this, to, to this page and not to the standard one. All the fat boxes, all of the stuff has to be used on the other one. That is the, the, the pain point that you have it. You have to create another extension that is taking the the fact boxes and then redirect the redirect to this kind of page. But anyway, this is it. Yeah. So next one, the read scale out. <laughs> That's <laughs> that that is fun. So the read scale out it is something that I think in the daily practice you have to do this. The read scale out and then define. Uh, in the API and uh, and the query the read intent, the property, and uh, you have to add this one as a, as, as a read only. And even, even if you don't have it, I think, because sooner or later, maybe this one will go into the online. And then when you take the leap to the online, then you have already all your development good to move your uh, object to be sent to the read only replica. So just 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 to keep it short, how this should supposed to work. So uh, in the online or even in the on premises, if you just have a read only replica, so you just have one one SQL server that is taking all the transactions, and those one are transferred to your second replica. This can be declared as uh, uh, completely not accessible. So then when this one might go down, then you can use the second one as the primary. So you continue right to this other one. Or you can decide that the second one can be uh, accept uh, a read only. So you can read something from there. And there is a delay of maybe seconds. I don't know, even if it will be much more than, than seconds, it would be acceptable in my opinion, unless you take some financial data that requires it. But Anyway, in uh, in the online version for certain Azure SQL, then you might have the right to have uh, this read uh, only replica on the other side. 
And if you speci specify this intent for your query and or your APIs, this one are not directed uh, to the uh, primary node, but will be redirected to the secondary node, to the other one, okay? So, and this will be good because it is like you using two SQL Server instead of one. And that is where this goes your performance benefit. So use this one, even if you do not have a, a, a read-only replica, because you never know, In the, it is a good praxis. In the future, you might have it. And if you have it, use it. That is the things with the, with the read-only. The read-only replica uh, option, and it is important to have those good habits. It's similar to when talking with development for extensions for PTE. I always you know, recommend to developers get into the good habit now of creating your apps that you're using even for PTEs as if they were going to be an app source. It, you know, it may be a little bit more work or maybe something you have to pay attention to, but if you're building a good habit and as things progress with the environment, the application, you're already all, you know, you're already in a good position to start. So this is another property Right. that is good to set and get used for your reports, your APIs, and your queries. Right. Exactly. Good. So, okay, that, uh, I think, yeah, we're almost there. So within the development, there is a big, big uh, things with uh, the index management. So the indexes uh, are, uh, I have pro and cons. So indexes are good for read, but they are bad for write. So, uh, if you create too many indexes, then when you do writes, those indexes, or you just do updates or deletes, this one needs to be done at SQL Server level. And then those things elongate the time that uh, you, you process data. But on the other side, uh, SQL Server leaves some breadth of uh, indexes. And it, it, it is a subtle art of uh, uh, creating the indexes. Currently, if speaking without speaking about the on online version or even with the business central itself, uh, you can create uh, new indexes, right? But you cannot disable indexes from other extensions, but you can create indexes based on even tables from uh, other extension. Of course, you cannot create uh, indexes in, uh, in from the uh, uh, from uh, uh, other tables, so you just have only uh, you can only create indexes from coming from your extensions. Maybe in Vnex you can start to disable these indexes because the things that I can see is that there is no one solution that fits all. For example, the indexes that that are that comes out of, out from the box for Business Central. Uh, are not useful for a production compared to a retail ones. So those need to be uh, tuned. And then you just need to reduce the number of indexes or you have to reduce some of the indexes that you have in from the retail experience from the one that you have it from the production experiences. So, and when this will come and if we were able, and if we will be able to do this kind of things, then most probably we will have a better experience on performances. Overall, on rights and everything will will go faster. That is that was a good thing. One, that was one that was on the roadmap at one point, and I think they removed it yes. uh, for that. But that True. is, as you had mentioned, what was done in earlier versions of NAV, where we had the checkbox to say enabled or disabled for the indexes, again, without making it even any other Save. modifications, because some of the performance uh, was determined by the use of the application. Another neat thing to do as you had mentioned is you can't create indexes across extensions and i'm assuming it's because you have separate tables for each extension i wonder and maybe hope that you have the ability to create extensions now that we have that one extension table i know it creates a dependency issue because if you have you know you have to make sure you have a dependency on that secondary application so you can make the index but hopefully that will be a feature that we can get as well so that Part, uh, partners that implement or implementations that are implemented with multiple extensions that even maybe you extend upon, you'll be able to create an index on the data that you have for that extension as well as what the base app uh, extension has. Right. But if you want to dream, dream big. <laughs> so let's say that you merge everything 
it, so everything it is in the as it was it in the legacy system. So you do not have any more a table extension, but everything it is in the same in the same record. So that you can do everything with the base application and also like it used to be in the past. But of course, yeah, it is the the the, the more you can do with those two tables, the better it is instead of creating or investigating what you can do. Uh, in order to streamline performance to create indexes. Yeah. It keeps sometimes it more complicated. It, yeah, sometimes, exactly. Say it, say it loud. <laughs> right. Okay. Then the next one, the three state locking, and there is also a big debate in these days about what it does, this three state locking enabled or changing uh, the from repeatable read to read committed. Uh, uh, uh level. Yeah, yeah exactly isolation level for uh for uh, read transactions and uh, it is it is actually it is quite complex and it is made of different pieces so the, the the really big weapon that we open up it is not really the read committed because if you do not enable another feature at database level that is called a read committed snapshot isolation right then repeatable read and read isolation are more or less similar because of they are locking, but the, the, they are locking, uh, they are keeping the, the, the locker until the, the, the transaction is done. But the, the difference between repeatable read and the read committed without enabling the read committed snapshot isolation is that they, they maintain the lock until uh, not until the transaction but for the duration of the read itself okay but they keep the lock if this lock what it is the the, the big game changer it is the read uh, um, the rci the read commits that the snapshot isolation feature that uh, instead of this big mambo jago locking thing with the shared lock per se it is taking a versioning. It is taking a versioning of the uh, value that in the writing transaction that you're having, it, it is taken and translated into 10 dB. So my read uh, transaction that with read committed only would have to wait for this read to be completed. It is taking the value from the 10 dB and do not wait for this uh, this uh, uh, long read uh, to to finish. In short, uh, if you want to to put it, it is that readers do not block writers. That that is the the thing. And uh, the, the thing, and that this is what we enable. So when we move to, from 23 as a company, we told our customer, this is for us the super big game changer together with uh, the the changes in the uh, in the table extension model but this one we do we enable this in the feature management and this is uh, good enough for the online version and for the on premises you just have to be sure that one key it is enabled in the custom settings.config and then at database level you just have to uh, uh, enable this feature that it is a read committed snapshot isolation. Those that are topic, the, the, al yeah. that topic alone, I think we could spend hours talking about because there is much conversation on that. Um, yeah. And I, you know, someone should, you know, look further into it. But as you talked about, the read committed snapshot isolation is on by default, I believe, in Azure SQL. Uh, where you have yeah. to turn it on is the on prem version and enable the tri state locking. Uh, feature within the on-prem business central implementation online it's available uh, by default i guess you could say yes definitely it is it is enabled so you just only need to turn uh, from feature management uh, uh, enable three state locking on or off this is an on off thingy so you can you can do on off for the moment until it will be the the state of the art hopefully for everyone Honestly, we are we are doing this with all of the updated online and also for the on-premises, and we never find out any issue at all. That can be 
uh, uh, directed to the enablement of the three-state locking. We found out better performance, yes, indeed. The lot, lot timeouts, we, we, it was reduced. And reduced the lot timeout, or even this, this also reduced the, if you have a performance problem where the deadlock was big one, the number of deadlock was reduce it and even the facet of that of change it well it is a big argument this one but enabling three state locking it is a good thing in my opinion no matter what so i can sustain in this one with many telemetry uh, uh queries or results that, that i have it on this side but enable three state locking and let this be the default on on any environment on premises and right I think we are just uh, running this. Okay, then I think we are we are ending, and then we just going with just a little bit with telemetry, and the, the performance mindset. So this is just one thing when, whatever you are, if you are project manager, if you are uh, I don't know a, a dog sitter, <laughs> whoever you are, those are the performance mindset. So the, then first it is. Write this, they call it the entrant code. So you just have to keep this method very short. This everything has to keep small, very, very small, right? So small reads, small write, small transaction. When everything is small, then you leave it to others to do stuff, right? Then the, the second thing it is lock only when necessary. So the, the thing is that the, the locks are at the, their cost. On, on SQL Server level, if you put a log, then this one has to be taken and then remove it. And maybe you're not the only one that is is using this kind of lock. So be careful on locking or no locking. Of course, better do on the safe side, better safe than sorry. Then run asynchronous in background as much as possible. So if you can do something, let's like say use page background task asynchronous, use everything run asynchronous. Put everything on the job queue if you want it. Background posting. So if you can let the the users be fluent on the UI. So that and this also goes into the the next concept that is apply the decouple principle. Being asynchronous means means also decoupling. So you're decoupling the UI from another background processor that, that will send you back the result. And then decouple completely means that integrate with other systems so let, let's let's say even the example that uh, stefano was giving about the images decouple it it, it is uh, an erp system not something where you store images uh, or whatever it is keep them outside and access them through i don't know uh, um http client calls or use the azure blob storage on the other side right so decouple as much as possible then when you develop, think about concurrency and scalability, that was, think about you're not the only one, then there are other people that in the ecosystem. And the scalability means that you don't have 10 records on the table, you might have one million record tested for this one. And then the retention policy, define and apply retention policy that will help you keep working with baby tables so you don't have to think about it all of a sudden that you have big monster table and then Oh my God, what do you have to do? And then you start to delete records. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah. the last one, trust in telemetry that it never lies. And again, yeah. once again, if you don't telemetry, have telemetry, exactly. Never it's, get uh, start. it's the must to have, uh, especially in Business Center Online, uh, uh, in order to investigate any type of performance issues or any type of, of problems in general. So uh it's a must to have it's a must to activate uh you do need to trust telemetry absolutely and uh also don't worry about costs we have prepared uh, some tips about costs yeah, just just because uh, we saw that normally partners are worried about cost about telemetry but uh, i honestly i, I know that do you agree that think that uh, telemetry is an investment that every partner should do for, for their customers. Uh, at Direction Semia, uh, we, when we have done, uh, in the last Direction, where we have done a, a session about telemetry, cost was one of the questions. And 
in every customer that we have from the biggest to the, the smallest, we see that without limits, telemetry is just like paying a, a cappuccino and a brioche to every user for a month. That's the cost, medium cost that we say to telemetry. So uh, without putting limits, then and later we will talk a bit about limits, but without putting limits, that's, that's the, the cost that the telemetry practice normally has. And I think that uh, every company can afford this type of, co of cost. So in, or in order to have uh, the tenant better managed and something like that. Uh, we at least, this is at least our experience. So uh, about telemetry, our suggestion in order to, you, you can control telemetry costs, absolutely. Uh, to control telemetry cost, one, one thing that you can do is setting uh, the maximum daily cap of ingestion that you can have. Uh, remember that the application size now has uh, uh, five gigabytes per subscription limit, not per instance, because someone thinks that it's per instance, it's not per instance, it's entire sub per subscription. Uh, that uh, the five gigabytes limit is free, otherwise uh, you start paying. Uh, you, but you can specify a, a daily cap, so no more than dot gigabytes of telemetry injected every day. And you can also set the data retention. Data retention is default 90 days. But uh, if you want to save cost and you don't want to have uh, uh, 90 days of uh, telemetry retention, retention, you can also reduce, for example, 30 days. 30 days is in, in many scenarios absolutely enough in, in order to, to monitor a customer. And this saves a lot of uh, uh, money. Uh, as I said before, this is... Uh, our best practice is a suggestion in order to control costs. What personally we have done, uh, say that uh, five gigabytes of data ingested per subscription is free every uh, month. Uh, normally, generally speaking, the limit to stay free is uh, to have a daily cap of uh, uh, 160 megabytes per day. Uh, because uh, normally a telemetry event in business center, a telemetry event is about uh, from two to 10 kilobytes medium. Uh, some of them, there are events with more, more data attached, more custom dimension attached, and uh, this uh, spans uh, until uh, 32 kilobytes. And uh, this is normally the cap that you need to set if you want to stay free. We are not saying that you need to stay free <laughs> because uh, these, these limits can be uh, often over, overwritten. So 160 megabytes per day is not uh, a very good limit if you want to fully monitor what happens in a month, for example, in your customer. Uh, what uh, we have personally done is to, in order to cut costs, is to impose uh, uh, rules, transformation rules for in injecting events. Uh, for example, one of the first thing that uh, uh, I personally done, but also do, I know that also the video has done, uh, is uh, checking in a week, for example, what are the signals that Business Center injected a lot. And uh, we use a query like this, very simple query that summarizes uh, in the period that you want the signal injected by Business Center. And doing this query, you discover what are the, uh, the maximum number, the, the, the big amount of, of signals that injected in, are injected in your tenant. And for example, this is a screenshot taken from one of my customers. Uh, you can see that here, RT004 is one of the main uh, signals injected in the tenant. But R RT004, for example, is uh, authorization. authorization succeeded. And this is a lot of signals that are injected into that tenant. And normally I don't want that, all these signals. So for example, uh, here yeah, with, with data collection rules in application insights, you can filter that, that uh, signals. And uh, by filtering that signals, you limit a lot the number of signals that injected into your telemetry store in order to have only the signals that really you want. 
uh, authorization succeeded, for example, is something that normally I exclude because I don't want to know uh, every uh, authorization succeeded signals. I also uh, eliminate, for example, RT0003, that is the pre-authorization succeeded. Uh, don't copy open. Exactly. I, I eliminate something like uh, uh, other events like I don't know, repo rendering when they are when these are listed linked to emails. Uh, so, uh, the, the the message is that with a query that checks the type of signal injected, you can limit the signals that you really want to have in telemetry with the simple transformation rules that where you can specify uh, all the signals that you want to have in the telemetry. And uh, uh, this permits you to reduce uh, the cost. The number of, uh, for example, one of the examples that, that we are reaching implementing a customer is related to uh, incoming web service call. Incoming web service call uh, is a signal, RT008, if I remember. Uh, and we have different publisher, different application that do incoming web service call. Uh, for some of them, for example, we don't want in a particular case that uh, uh, we we'll need to log incoming web service call coming from a particular publisher. So in telemetry, you can also exclude uh, uh, this type of signal coming from a particular publisher. Uh, or AMP or, 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 or something like that. And yeah. this limits a lot the telemetry that uh, uh, you need to uh, ingest. To, sto to store yeah. ingest and that this saves cost that is one of the i think uh, there's two parts to telemetry i think some are afraid of it to be honest because they don't understand or they're not certain how to use the kql for the queries or even transfer over to what you're talking about and thank you uh, you, you had some great information that you presented on the screen with the with the uh, query to see what type of events were entered so that you could filter them out. So by setting a daily cap limit and excluding a number of these, what I call noise, uh, yeah. uh, um, uh, you could call them events or uh, uh, triggers or uh, traces, that you can limit the amount of data that gets captured so you can see the information that you need versus spending either with your free or for that cappuccino and the, the pastry, as I call it, uh, for each user on data that's not relevant. So yeah. it is important to understand telemetry and telemetry is added to, they, they keep adding more and more information to help with yeah. performance. So it's, it's very important to... Yes, another filter that, for example, we, I, I personally use in uh, the transformation rules is, for example, filtering by companies. You can for example, accept only events that comes from the production company and not from uh, uh, the big list of other temporary companies that uh, maybe your consultant or something like that creates in the Sand, center. Sandbox. We filter sandbox. Uh, or, 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 directly the environment the environment type. or directly the environment. Environment type sandbox, we remove uh, it. Because when you do a copy, well, there are other stuff that, that, you, that you can remove the the telemetry key, but when you do a copy from the production database to a sandbox, then this one, it is taking with him also the uh, connection string. So then all of a sudden you just have this sandbox, right? That is sending uh, signals. So that is why oh. we are filtering out all sandboxes, <clears throat> except some except someone that we would like to have this kind of sandboxes and we specify this in this transformation rule so the transformation rule it is like gandalf that say <laughs> you shall not pass that is the thing and then on the other side you got this big balrog that is trying to enter and then consume you know <laughs> then consume your your money into an Azure bill. So no, it is yeah. important. And that's the key right. point of what you have both mentioned is, uh, you know, the transformation rules will help govern the amount of data, just be aware of the signals, and what you're logging, and know that you have the option to customize that or filter that down to your specific instance to 
minimize, uh, you know, sometimes a lot of people are cost centric, which I understand because you don't want it to run away and then get a, a large bill one month. But also, I try to explain when I talk about it, sometimes there's also a cost to solvent performance issues. So either you're going to pay for it in labor or have a tool available that you can use to read through that gives you a lot of information that will take you less time, potentially. Yeah. Uh, you know, every situation is different, less time to solve a problem. So it's, it's, it's the tangible and the uh, uh, untangible or intangible costs that you have in this situation. Uh, but knowing that the option is there and hearing how you two use it uh, on a day-to-day -day basis with your customers is, is helpful and valuable. Yeah, we used to say that with telemetry, it is just an insurance. You know, you're paying an insurance. It is just an insurance on your data. If they start to have some problem like performance and then you just have the insurance, then you can analyze them very easily. Otherwise, you just have to wait that you enable telemetry and then and then you just have to reproduce the problem, etc. But we used to, to add this as an insurance and really it doesn't cost that much. Let's say a coffee or a cappuccino per user, depending on if you have APIs or many things, how many transactions you're doing. It is not based on the user per se, but, but you can start determine how many transactions you have in a priori, right? When you go live in the implementation, then you just have this rule of thumb and then we give it and the prices is this just a coffee per user per month or a exactly. cappuccino, depending on, on the dimensions, right? Exactly. I think that we have uh, shared the, all the main tips that we want to share That's today. incredible tips though. These are phenomenal. Uh, thank you. Those are incredible tips. Not only did we learn about pizza, <laughs> wine, some it Italian culture, we learned about many performance tips for development, as well as the use of telemetry. Uh, you, you both know a lot of, as we found in the discussion, and I know from uh, a lot of the material that you pr both present, you know a lot of performance tips and tricks. What tips do you have for someone who wants to learn how to do this? Do you look at the SQL queries? Do you look at telemetry? Do you use the Business Central Performance Toolkit, also known as BCPT? If somebody wants to get into it like you both do to be able to solve performance issues, where would they start to look? What is most helpful to somebody to be able to start that journey? Right. So I'll divide this into on-premises and online, of course. And then I'll start with the online. So within the online, if you have a performance problem, there's no other way than going with telemetry. No other way. So the first thing that you started is learning just a little bit of KQL. If you know TSQL, that it is uh, the, <laughs> the father of KQL, so to speak, of the Custo Query language, then you will uptake this in no time, in zero time, right? And this, the added value that what telemetry will give you is not only to resolve in performance probably, problems, you will start with this because then you just have the, the, the biggest gain initially because you are solving a problem. But then suddenly you realize that the, the telemetry, it is also used for observability, the famous data-driven. And then you can inspect how your application as a wall, like, like a living system, it is moving. So you, you can even predict if you might have a problem in the future by, by checking the trends of growing, uh, probably queries or long running queries in terms of numbers or in terms of uh, uh, average. Right, and then you can create a sort of spark line of every single of these queries. And then, you know, okay, we are at the point that in one month, this one, it is growing at this rate. In one month, because of this query, it is looking at this amount of data that is, is growing up. And then we have to take measure proactively before the user starts saying, okay, yesterday it was two seconds. Right now we have seven seconds right after. So you don't get strangulated by this one. And 
that's that's a good practice that you have to put in place but you have to go back to use telemetry for the online and i'm trying to adopt the same things even on the on-premises actually but your premises you also have the control of your sql server box and then in there you just have a vast uh, plethora of uh, analysis tool that you can find it on on the market that you can install it and then they give you the missing indexes they will give you the unused indexes to balance the two things blocking who is blocking who uh, then that a looks a different story okay. it is yes you you have the over, the control over it but the, the thing is that it is it might be very complicated if you want to start with this uh, uh, right now from scratch and in my opinion if you start right now from scratch and from business center you just have to adopt telemetry even for the on premises so that you can spend your knowledge in a cloud ready version telemetry is good for the on premises and also for the online and then there's i think there's no yes. valuable things then uh, using telemetry the same this way thing. i think it's a good practice uh, yes. because you can apply all the rules, the uh, tips that you have in a, in a common environment, uh, ready also if they, the day the on-premise customer will move to the cloud. Uh, so starting from the same practice is, is absolutely, also in my opinion, a best practice. Obviously in the on-premise, you can also, for more complex things or something like that, you can also go to the SQL level but I think that uh, having the same practice, so having application inside connected to the on-premise environment too, it's uh, absolutely a good practice. Yeah, Microsoft it's like has... ask. Yes, it's like asking today. Oh, there is a CAL and then there is AL, right? Well, you just have to hire someone. So you want to learn, train him with the CAL and then AL to know the history and be completed. I would say start directly with the yell and forget about the past, even with telemetry. I know, I know that you might have, and I'm going back to the good old SQL Server Profiler, but because something still you have to search using SQL Server Profiler. But if you start, start with telemetry first and forget other tools. Yeah. yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Well, I have to say it. Dwilio, Dwilio, Dwilio. <laughs> Thank you so much. Brad, Brad, Brad. Brad, Brad, Brad. Brad. That's, I, I had to get it out Chris, there. Chris, Chris. That's it. Uh, so we have to just do and you do this, right? Brad, Brad. Oh, yeah, yes, I need to do the hand. And then, oh, I remember. The, the gesture. This one. Watch. Exactly, yeah, exactly. that's it. That's it. Yes. Thank you both so much for your time that you spent with us today there was a wide range of information that we discussed all the way from as i'd mentioned i learned pizza, a lot today the wine, <laughs> a little italian history yes. uh, mm -hmm. to, to development tips uh, and telemetry thanks a lot to you for hosting that uh, that space uh, i think Absolutely. it's a gr very great initiative Yes, Thank and if everyone in the community, Brad, Christopher, or everyone in the community would like to to come in Italy and receive any kind of tips, not only <laughs> performance, but overall, because Especially... <laughs> you, you would like to spend some days, just uh, shoot us an email or contact us in the social LinkedIn or Twitter, and then I would be more than glad to send them all the kind of tips that you wanted, where to spend your vacation, and then whatever the, the best good things to visit depending on how much time you want to stay in italy and even the hidden gem that, that you have it of course you have to go to venice uh, milan rome uh, and florence of course those are the, the the big ones to visit once in a lifetime but as stated italy has got a full of treasure right full of yeah. treasure and with that, I will take you up on that. I have to I'll start building a list for Europe. But with that, you both do quite a bit for the community. You have a lot of conversations and share a lot of information. You speak at engagements and share the knowledge that you have, to which I'm very thankful for. Uh, and, and everyone in the community is thankful. For. I know uh, I have from conversations with everybody. With that, how 
uh, you talked about reaching out for tips and tricks, not only for Business Central, but also for travel and tour through uh, Italy. How would uh, you recommend someone get in contact with you to learn more about some of the things we discussed today and see some of the other great things that you're doing in publishing for the community, uh, Dwilio? Well, it, it, they can reach me on Twitter or LinkedIn or just shoot me an email at uh, uh, ditaconi at hotmail.com. That is open to everyone. For me, it's the same story. Uh, my, the best way to reach me is uh, directly on my social, so Twitter or LinkedIn, or uh, personal email, uh, uh, my surname at, at outlook.com. Uh, or directly from blogs, I have a uh, possibility to directly write a contact from him, from here. So the best way to reach me in, is here. I'm absolutely available. And usually I receive quite a lot of questions from partners and, and customers. And, and so uh, they know that I usually ask them. Very good. <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, we will put the links to those in the show notes so that if... Um... Uh, somebody would like to see what they either on there. And Chris, usually when it is wonderful editing of these, he puts up the information on the YouTube video, which in this case, we had some uh, great shared information. So for those that listened only, I do recommend going Perfect. back and, and viewing the YouTube video. Uh, again, thank you very, <laughs> do I do it? Thank you very Perfect. much for your time thank today. You thank you. Thank you. And arrivederci. <laughs> Arrivederci. Arrivederci. I'm learning Italian. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys, Thank you. for this. And Thanks, hope, it, hope, hope to see you soon, uh, very person. soon. Uh, yeah. in, 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 in person. I'm, I'm, I'm in sure day. we will go across. Thank you very yeah. much. With, with the I bottle of wine. <laughs> oh, several <laughs> bottles of wine. Several bottles Indeed. of wine. Bye, bye, bye. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Have a good one. Ciao. Thank you, Chris, for your time for another episode of In the Dynamics Corner Chair. And thank you to our guests for participating. Thank you, Brad, for your time. It is a wonderful episode of Dynamics Corner Chair. I would also like to thank our guests for jo joining us. Thank you for all of our listeners tuning in as well. You can find Brad at developerlife.com. That is D-V-L-P-R-L-I-F-E.com. And you can interact with them via Twitter, D-V-L-P-R-L-I-F-E. You can also find me at matalino.io, M-A-T-A-L-I-N-O dot I-O. And my Twitter handle is matalino16. And see, you can see those links down below in their show notes. Again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, and take care. <laughs>